1918, the city engineer of San Francisco approached Joseph Strauss, then a consulting engineer with a long list of bridge contracts to his credit. The city engineer asked if a bridge could be built across the Golden Gate at a reasonable cost. After three years of study, Strauss replied that it could for $27 million. This was in 1921. Such a bridge was an obvious need. San Francisco Bay formed a 50 mile long barrier to highway traffic in the San Francisco area. And the entrance from the sea, known as the Golden Gate, separated the growing city on the south from the lightly populated and excellent recreation areas of Marin County. While a bridge was an obvious need, it was not an obvious possibility. The challenge was not to bridge a river or a valley, but an arm of the ocean. The proposed bridge was this one, impressive in its simplicity, modern in its concept. The center span from tower to tower would be 4,200 feet long, the longest ever attempted in that time. The side spans would each be 1,125 feet long. The roadway would be some 250 feet above the choppy waters of the bay. Construction began officially on January 5th, 1933. The film you're about to see is old, but these flickering scenes still portray the story of building this great bridge. Huge sections, formed and temporarily assembled at the shops, are disassembled and shipped by rail to the Philadelphia docks. It takes miles of railroad cars to carry the steel for the towers and suspended span. At Philadelphia, the sections are loaded aboard ships of Bethlehem's Kalmar Line for the long trip to San Francisco by way of the Panama Canal. And finally, through the Golden Gate, into San Francisco Bay. Fabricating the steelwork and transporting it to Alameda will extend over a period of almost four years. At the Golden Gate, construction begins with the Marin Pier, which is built on bedrock on the North Shore, the work being protected by a sheet piling coffer dam. When the last of the concrete has been poured on the North Pier, its surface is ground to a true plane. This is to ensure that the steel superstructure will start true and plumb. The towers, which will be erected on each pier, are identical. 702 feet of steel rising to an elevation of 746 feet above sea level. Two legs joined together by six cross braces. The legs are 90 feet apart on centers. Clearance between the legs at deck level is 60 feet. The width of the six-lane roadway. Moving the steel from storage at Alameda to the bridge site is a sizable effort in logistics. The lowermost sections of the tower are anchored to vertical steel angles, which have their roots 53 feet below the surface of the pier. These angles are pre-stressed before riveting to the tower legs, so they will exert a downward pull on the tower, a safeguard against the stresses of wind and earthquake. As the year 1933 unfolds, the Marin Tower climbs toward the roadway level. As the tower progresses upward, the traveler erects the tower legs, then raises itself and builds the braces behind it. Each time the traveler is raised, its weight must first be shifted to cat heads placed atop the tower legs. Then the four plungers which support the traveler are withdrawn from reinforced slots in the tower legs. The traveler, moving upwards in about 10 minutes, gains another 40 feet of headway on the towers.
one red hot rivet coming up, special delivery to men working by the light of miners' lamps inside the tower. The riveters work on double platform scaffolding, driving simultaneously on several levels. Hundred thousand field rivets will be needed to complete each of the towers. One writer will later describe the towers of the Golden Gate Bridge as riveter's paradise. By 1934, the legs of the North Tower are some 500 feet above the water, about 50 stories high. From bottom to top, the cellular principle of construction remains the same. Plates of steel riveted to angles, forming a beehive of cells. This construction principle creates a maze of passages in which men will occasionally become lost for short periods. But it is a principle which helps explain the immense strength of the two towers. As the year 1934 unfolds, a bold silhouette rises above the Golden Gate. The horizontal cross struts above the roadway level will help the tower legs act as a unit in resisting lateral forces. For the top of each tower leg, there is a massive cable saddle cast at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Each saddle is a three-piece steel casting. They are mounted on rollers to allow movement during erection of the span. Later, they will be fixed in position. Placing the cable saddles in November 1934 essentially completes the North Tower. However, long before the first tower reaches completion, workmen across the bay begin building the second concrete pier for the South or San Francisco Tower. All things considered, this pier and fender wall represent one of the most difficult underwater construction feats ever attempted. The pier was successfully completed in January of 1935. It took about a year and a half. On January 10th, 1935, the San Francisco Tower is begun. The traveler Derek, lowered from the North Tower, is reassembled on the second pier and begins another climb skyward. As the tower progresses upward, Kalmar Line ships continue their deliveries of fabricated steelwork to Alameda. The San Francisco Tower is completed by late June, 104 days ahead of schedule. On November 11th, 1935, the task of spinning the two great cables is begun. From then on, the Golden Gate is steadily bridged wire by wire. The workmen of the cable contractor stitch the north and south shores together with 80,000 miles of wire. Each wire measures just under one-fifth of an inch in diameter, slightly smaller than a lead pencil. Spinning carriages shuttle from anchorage to mid-span, playing out as many as six wires on each trip. The cables, when completed, will weigh 22,000 tons apiece. It's interesting to note that each cable weighs approximately as much as each tower. The wires, 27,572 of them per cable, build up to a compacted cable slightly over three feet in diameter. Later, as the roadway takes shape, the cables will be wrapped with galvanized wire and painted to protect them against the elements. The spinning of the cables is completed in May of 1936. 
Bethlehem, builder of the towers, begins erecting the suspended span on June 18th. The entire span would be constructed from elementary structural forms. The stiffening truss panels would consist of top and bottom cords, diagonals, and verticals. The verticals are spaced at 25-foot intervals. Suspender strands occur at every other vertical. The truss measures 28 feet deep. The roadway floor beams are eight and a half feet deep, 87 feet long, and weigh, on the average, 23 tons each. Generally speaking, the floor beams occur at each vertical in the stiffening trusses. Roadway stringers atop the floor beams carry the 60-foot roadway. Knee braces tie in the floor beams and bottom cords. The summer of 1936 sees the first three panels erected by cantilevering each way from the towers. Chicago booms at the roadway level handle the steel for this work. One of the unique features of job is the emphasis placed on safety. As the roadway moves outward from each tower, a manila rope safety net is introduced. Assembled first at water level, the net and its frame are lifted to position beneath the span. As erection proceeds, additional sections of net will be positioned, always in advance of the workmen. Eventually, the net will extend the entire length of the bridge. Also, the net reaches some 10 feet beyond the width of the span on each side. As erection proceeds, the first three panels of roadway are planked over. The steelwork is delivered from Alameda to the base of the towers, then hoisted to this planked over area. From there, the steel members move out on a buggy to the point of construction. After the first three panels are planked over, the balance of the span erection is handled by traveler derricks. In the erection of the trusses, Two 25-foot panels are cantilevered forward, assembled piece by piece. The first vertical is joined to the projecting bottom cord. The diagonals are then erected, followed by the top cord. And so the span progresses, moving out truss by truss in four directions to maintain equal loading on the cables and towers. When each set of two truss panels is connected to the suspenders, the floor beams are swung into place. These will be followed by reinforcing laterals and some of the roadway stringers. The net proves to be a success. It saves 19 lives. There are many special provisions for the safety of the men during erection. For example, for protection against head injuries, the workmen wear hard hats. And whenever they can work with limited movement, the men use safety belts with tie-off lines. By fall of 1936, residents of San Francisco are treated to the sight of a span which moves steadily closer to the day when the two halves will meet. The partial loading of cables and towers gives the span an unnatural curvature. It looks as though the main span will meet at a peak. 
Bethlehem and the cable contractor worked together to control the cable curvature and saddle movements. Soon, the erection gangs on the main span are within hailing distance. Then, the safety nets meet. Finally, on November 18, 1936, the closing members are lowered into place. The Golden Gate is bridged. For Chief Engineer Joseph Strauss, and for every engineer who has contributed to the work, this is a day of realization, the type of day which fulfills the life of an engineer, first as a dream, then as a magnificent accomplishment. But the job is far from over. Painters apply the final coat, a special color prepared for this bridge, International Orange by name. The buggies bring out fabricated sections for the sidewalks and railings. These items, and the balance of the roadway stringers, are erected as the traveler derricks work their way back to the towers. Bethlehem Steel's role in building the bridge is coming to an end, a role that involved the fabrication and erection of close to 70,000 tons of steelwork. When the derricks and other structural tools are removed, the paving contractor installs and welds the reinforcing steel for the concrete roadway. This web of steel will transmit traffic loads to the stringers. makes one of its regular visits as the finishing touches are added to the bridge, creating a strange kind of beauty. And so, the work is completed. The bridge that pessimists said could not be built has been built. May 28th, 1937. Opening day. Newspaper accounts vary on the amount of celebrating done by San Francisco. Some say four days, some say a week. It was a celebration worthy of the bridge.